And so the motivation is paramount. Everything that you can you will accomplish in this path, in your life, in your path, is dependent on your motivation. Your results will not exceed your motivation. So you need to have your motivation be vast and unconditional and inclusive of every being without exception that they could all be placed at a level of immediate and ultimate enlightenment. And that is why you practice the most expedient path of the path of, of the truth. The truth of non-divided nature, the truth of timeless presence and awareness, the truth of Buddha nature. And we do that in three ways. We do that with our body, no longer practicing the truth of our ordinary body, but through the practice of visualization, we practice recognizing our extraordinary nature of body. The truth practiced by speech, not just ordinary words, not just ordinary, you know, mental uh, uh, speech habits like gossip and uh, and uh, harsh speech and you know, saying whatever suits you according to how it works out for you. So truth is always flexible. These are not virtues. And so then you begin to recognize, um, along with correction of negative tendencies, the nature of sound, the quality of sound, that sounding is uh, has a perfection. That perfection permeates sounding. And this is called mantra. Practicing the speech of enlightenment. The sounding of non-divided truth. And all pervasive timeless presence. And finally, the mind. Now our mind pops around like a, a, a Mexican jumping bean. Hope and fear and this and that. Ramjay used to tell me when I would be sitting beside him, he would say to me, you're like a flea. <laughs> Your mind is just jumping from here to there all the time. And it was true. I had every other thought. I had every other you know, emotion. I had every other speculation and wonder and curiosity and so much activity of my mind. And the capacity to turn your mind to virtue to turn your mind away from negative tendencies like um, covetousness and anger and wrong view. But more than that, to liberate your mind in the quality of openness, awareness that is Buddha mind, that is your mind when you are free of all these mitigating circumstances like karma, habit, and um, uh, division. These poisons of the mind really mess us up. And they it's like, you know, we spin out of control and it takes a long time to finally be able to relax your mind. So the path is the practice is kind of, in a way, simultaneous. And I want to use an example real quickly because it was very beautiful. Because when I was the translator for Chakta Rinpoche for many, many years, I didn't translate Tibetan, of course, don't get the wrong idea. All I did was rephrase Rinpoche's broken English into a manner that people could understand. And Rinpoche had been teaching for hours, and like I do, he would go on for on and a long time, on and on, and I would write like this, and then I would repeat, and I would get very tired. She's probably really tired, and she's serving us. She's serving the Buddha, she's serving me, she's serving you, and of course she's learning in the meantime, but I would get tired, and then after Rinpoche finally finished, he would say, 
Are there any questions? And I was so angry. Like, I would look at the people and I would, my mind and their mind would connect very clearly. They should not ask any questions because I was done. <laughs> Rinpoche always did it and he always delighted in it. He always delighted in that moment of me past my edge. And then somebody asked a question. I couldn't believe it. And it was funny that day because I was so angry and I had no chance to indulge my anger because Rinpoche was clearly a Buddha teaching and these are the sentient beings full of room of what was their chance to ever hear a teaching like that again and how could I in my exhaustion be a limit to the I mean I just didn't have time to even really indulge myself I just went on but the ground water of my anger started to rise and at a point my it felt like my eyelashes were at the rim of where my anger was. I was so angry. Why he had to go on so long. And then this beautiful question came. And this man stood up and he said, you gave us the most beautiful teaching on all these methods, the method of harmlessness and helpfulness, the method of pure motivation and inclusivity and pure aspiration for enlightenment. You gave us the method of relaxing our mind and practicing the truth as the path. He said, but what am I supposed to do? How can I do all that? What am I supposed to do? And Rinpoche, he was so kind, and he said, well, I can share with you what I do. And he said, If I can, I sit on the mountaintop of pure awareness, omnidirectional, edgeless, openness, presence, being. But if I should fall to the ordinary thoughts of hope and fear, the steep cliffs of the ambitions and speculation of my life. He said, I use the teachings of the skillful means of Vajrayana like ropes and, and, and pulleys and hooks to, to climb again the steep cliffs of visualization, recitation, and meditation. And it's very steep, but I have tools, and I climb very well. But if I should fall, and I roll down into the grassy foothills, I remember with love and compassion all sentient beings who, just like me, long to be free of suffering, and just like me, wish that every being could be able to attain enlightenment. And I pull myself up and I walk step by step back up the, the grassy hills of pure motivation. And if I'm not able to catch myself even on those grassy foothills and I roll all the way to the flat land of um, of, of the earth. I practice carefully acceptance and rejections, learning, adhering to what will help me and refraining from what would harm me, adhering to pure, to kindness and goodness and rejecting hatred and aggression and violence towards others. And no matter what, I try my very best not to dig a hole of my own bad mind and actions that would put me even deeper in the dirt 
and the and the suffering because I'm angry or because I'm selfish or because I'm greedy because every thought every word and every action is creative and I was just overwhelmed with joy how magnificent was his example of this beautiful mountain of practice. Sometimes you can't sit on the top of the mountain. All you can do is climb the steep cliffs of, of visualization, recitation, and meditation. Sometimes you can't even do that. All you can do is cultivate pure motivation in, and recognize that whatever it is you're suffering, they're suffering too, and even greater. And then turn to the pure wishes and aspirations and the pure engagement of bodhicitta and, altru and altruistic aspiration for the benefit of others. And if you aren't able to even do that like you have a bad day and you're all the way on the ground of ordinary just trying to not dig a hole of your own negative tendencies, then you remember the Lama, you remember the Buddha, you remember the Dharma, you remember and you pray, illustrious Tara, please be aware of me, remove my obstacles and quickly grant my excellent aspirations that not only I but every being could attain enlightenment. And you contemplate, you relax, you remember and you relax. You think about it and you relax. You remember the Lama and you relax. And when you come to the end of your practice, you dedicate the merit of everything you've been through, of everything you've tried. If it was the path of self-improvement, or the path of Mahayana, or the path of Vajrayana, or just the path of regret and confessing whatever flaws you have, anything that you do, you dedicate by this, may every being attain enlightenment. At the end of that teaching, Rinpoche kind of, you know, people were milling around, leaving, and Rinpoche kind of leaned over to me, and he said, you were angry, weren't you? And I, I laughed because he knew me so well. There was just no hiding anything from Rinpoche. And I said, yes, Rinpoche, I was so angry, so angry. And he said, you are brilliant. And this was because I couldn't stop. I had to serve the Buddha. I had to serve my mother sentient beings. And I had to keep going until, you know, I could finally relax my mind.